Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. In today's video, we're going to be talking about how to organize and display data. In subsequent videos in the course, we're going to be talking in a lot of detail about how you can actually analyze data for different designs and different data types. But one of the really key things that accompanies the analysis of data is how we can accurately and efficiently display that data. So if you're like me as a child growing up, you had a lot of Transformers toys, or you watched the movie or the TV show, or you read the comic books, or maybe all of those things. Um, but if you remember the toys at all, on the back of the box, they had these descriptions of the characters. And they gave you like a little bio about them. So, you know, this is Prowl. His function is that he's a military strategist. He's one of the Autobots, who are the, the good guys of the Transformers universe. Um, but one of the things that they also give you that I always liked was they have these different dimensions. So they give you these abilities on which the characters are ranked. And, you know, we don't necessarily need to know a lot about what a 1 means or a 10 means to see that Prowl has some distinct strengths and weaknesses, right? So he's quite intelligent, he's courageous, he has a lot of skills, but he seems to be somewhat lacking in firepower, at least relative to his other abilities. And this kind of chart, right, this is this is essentially a, an early kind of bar plot, um, gives us some quick description of how Prowl functions. It doesn't tell us how he'll do in every situation, right? It's not the complete picture of everything, but it's a nice, concise summary. Uh, and it tells us a lot about, you know, who this individual is. Similarly, if we want to look to some more famous examples of data visualizations than old Hasbro toy boxes, right, good data visualizations can tell a very compelling story. So for instance, this is the diagram of the causes of mortality in the Army in the East by Florence Nightingale, and her work was tremendously influential in advancing germ theory and advancing sanitation and, and cleanliness practices in military hospitals. And what she was able to do was show this data, which she painstakingly accumulated during the Crimean War, to actually look at the casualties caused uh, from battlefield on the battlefield and from battlefield injuries, shown in red, uh, those due to uh, preventable or mitigable disease, shown in blue, and deaths due to kind of all other causes, right, which could include things that we didn't necessarily know the cause for um, or, or anything else that doesn't fit into those other two categories. And what she was able to show then was the extreme number of individuals who were dying effectively of preventable diseases um, in military hospitals and generally away from the battlefield. Um, and now this was, you know, in a time before kind of modern ideas of germs and sanitation. But what she was able to very compellingly show was that the number of individuals who were dying kind of away from the traditional horrors of war, right, was dwarfing the number of individuals who were actually dying and suffering in battle. And if we could do something to prevent these deaths, it would actually go a long way toward reducing mortality in the army. Uh, and Florence Nightingale was an incredibly influential figure in the development not only of medical statistics, right, but nursing uh, and, and epidemiology. So, so this was, is a very famous plot uh, in, in a lot of different fields. And Florence Nightingale is a very influential person who I'd encourage you to read more about. Similarly, this is a map uh, created by the anesthesiologist John Snow, um, and he was an anesthesiologist, but he was very influential in the birthplace of epidemiology, right, as the study of disease, in part for his work during the cholera outbreak of, in London uh, in, in 1854. Um, and we're zoomed in on this figure, but what you can kind of see are these stacked bars on different locations. And so this is kind of combining a map with a histogram. And what Snow did was he looked at the number of deaths due to cholera in each of these different locations. And through careful analysis of where people were dying and where people were not dying, um, based on where they were getting their water, he was able to show that the actual cholera was being carried in contaminated water, and in particularly to this source and this Broad Street pump. Um, and, and his analysis was very influential, again, in advancing kind of the germ theory of disease um, and led to then pr um, the cessation of that cholera epidemic. For instance, they took the handle off the Broad Street pump and brought in water from other sources and preventing future cholera epidemics because obviously sanitation and avoiding human contamination was stepped up in a big way um, after these research findings. Now, we can do this for all kinds of different things. You know, there's a tremendous diversity of plots out there. But for instance, here we're looking at arm function following a stroke. So this is an individual's impaired arm. 
um, for a bunch of different individuals. And without getting into too much detail about it, basically a zero would be healthy function, four would be severely impaired function. And we're looking at how these individuals progress over the course of a clinical trial. Um, and what we can see then is where you started, right? Which category of arm function you fell into, and then how you flow into the next node of the diagram, right? So we might have some people who started at a four, but they improved a lot very quickly and then retained that improvement. Some people who started at a four and improved a little bit but then their improvements were more gradual over time, right? And you can track different individuals throughout these diagrams. And this is what's known as an alluvial plot, um, or also known as a, a Sankey diagram for the engineer Matthew Sankey, who originally developed this to actually show literal, you know, flow um, and, uh, and kind of volumes traveling through different nodes and diagrams. So again, lots of different ways of presenting information, um, but there are going to be some key features of presenting information that make for good data visualizations, and that's what we want to focus on. So first, we always want to provide a summary of the data that is accurate. And second, we want to provide a summary of the data that is efficient. And these two things can at times be at odds, because one of the most accurate things might be for me to just plot every single data point that I have, right? That's accurate. It's all there. But it's not necessarily very efficient, because someone can't quickly look at all of that raw data and get a sense of what the data is saying. So these are sometimes in contrast, but we always want to make sure that our data are as accurate as possible, right? We don't want it to be misleading. Um, but we also want it to be easy to understand. So we're going to work hard to try to make sure that both of those constraints are satisfied. So what are some important pieces of information that we might want to convey in order to do that? Well, first we might want to show something about the typical value in our data. We might want to show how individuals spread out around that typical value. And we might want to show if scores are symmetrically or asymmetrically distributed, right? Because ultimately what we want to convey is the distribution of the data. And what do we mean by the distribution of the data, right? Well, um, a distribution is any set of values present in a sample or a population. It'll tell us which values occur and how often. And this is the starting point for basically everything we want to do in statistics. So every statistic, right, that we might calculate, be it a mean, a median, a standard deviation, is computed, computed from some sample distribution. And every parameter that we're trying to estimate, right, is the property of a population distribution. And if we could measure everyone, we would get the population distribution and we could plot that. In general, we're not going to get that, right? So we're going to try to be able to make inferences about the population based on the data that we observe in our sample. So we need ways of visualizing these different distributions because it is basically the story that our data is trying to tell us and it's often essential to the assumptions that we're making in our statistical analyses. So in particular, when we're making these distributions, we focus on the center, the spread, and the shape of the distribution, and we want to make sure that those things are being conveyed accurately and efficiently. So what we can actually do in terms of different data visualizations depends a lot on the scales of measurement. And we've talked about this in previous videos, but as a reminder, we have ratio data, we have interval data, we have ordinal data, and we have nominal data. And in general, we can perform a lot more math mathematical operations with interval and ratio data because the distance between you know, units on those scales really means something. Whereas with ordinal and nominal data, well, we're a lot more limited in the types of mathematical operations that we can actually perform, um, especially when we get down to the level of nominal data, because there all we can really say is that two things aren't the same. You know, uh, uh, Democrats aren't Republicans, right? Uh, males aren't females, right? They're, they're, these aren't, uh, you know, like units that are separated by mathematically meaningful values. They're qualitative differences that we've often imposed on the data. So as we ascend this scale, right, we have more information contained at different scales of measurement. And that means that different analyses are going to be appropriate. And it also means that different types of data visualizations are going to be appropriate. So as a starting point, let's think about a frequency table as kind of the most bare bones type of data visualization we might have. A frequency table simply tells us the frequency of a specific value. So if this was our sample, right, and we wanted to know, well, what's the frequency of six? We could look through the data and count that there are two sixes. F of six is going to be two, right? And we could build this up um, across uh, a bunch more data and with a bunch more different values. So the goal of the frequency table is to show the frequency of all values. Generally, we have a first common column that shows the value and a second column that shows the frequency. So if these are our data, now 
it's a little harder to just look at that and get a sense of all the numbers. But if I put it into a frequency table, right, I can tell you, ah, well, there was one, two, there were four threes, you know, five, six fives, four sevens, and there was one eleven. And this is a lot easier to consume than this raw presentation of the data. Taking that a step further, we can essentially flip our frequency table on its side and create a bar plot. And the bar plot is going to show the frequency of all values based on the height of a specific bar. So if I had people responding with their favorite colors, right, maybe this is the distribution that I actually get in my sample, and I create this frequency table. It's a pretty good summary, and you can look at it and understand it pretty quickly, but I can also convert this into a bar plot, right, where now I'm showing you the number of people who picked red, green, blue, yellow, or orange. Now, this is very useful, uh, especially for nominal or ordinal data, because the divisions being made on the x-axis here are categorical, which is to say, red doesn't have to come first, right? I could put these in alphabetical order, or I could put them in descending order of height. It doesn't matter. There's no intrinsic structure to the order of these colors, so I could put them in whatever order I want. And if I can kind of flip around the order of the axis, I have nominal data or you know, uh, ordinal data, although at least for ordinal data, I should usually put them in the order that they go in. Um, but th in this case, if I have nominal data, I can put them in any order I want. And it's, all right, if I have nominal data, I can put them in any order I want. And it doesn't matter because the x-axis is arbitrary. We can contrast the bar plot then with a true histogram. So let's say instead of people responding with their favorite colors, I actually have people's weights. So here's the weights for 94 people. Again, if I just print all those on the screen, oh, that's really hard to process. So I'd like to get a nice summary of the data. So what we can do is actually look at these weights in a histogram, right? So I have then uh, on my x-axis bins, right? So um, it's, it's similar to the bar plot in that I am kind of chunking these things into groups. So I'm saying, okay, between 80 and 100, what was the frequency of scores between 80 and 100? What was the frequency of scores between 100 and 120? But the difference is here I have truly continuous data, so I can't change the order of these bars. 80 to 100 always has to come before 100 to 120, and then 120 to 140, and so on and so forth. But if I do that, I can get a really nice, quick summary of all of the information that otherwise would have taken me forever to read when it was presented in a textual format up here. So this histogram gives me a nice, accurate, and efficient summary of the information I'm trying to present. Okay, but what if we want to scale this up to something a little more complicated, and I'm not, I don't want to just show like a single variable. Well, let's consider a, a, a two by two factorial design, right? By which we just mean that we had two variables and they each had two levels in each of those variables. And that's actually shown over here. So this was an experiment where participants walked at fast or, or self-selected walking speeds um, at a virtual high or low height, right? So I have their fast speed in one panel, their self-selected speed in another panel, then they're walking at height or they're walking uh, basically at ground level. And then they're rating their effort in the task. And what we can then plot is their mean level of effort. So this was across, I think, like 20 individuals or something like that. But we're looking at their, their, their self-perceptions of effort um, in both the low and the high condition and at both self-selected and fast walking speed. So this is pretty good because we have a measure of central tendency. Uh, so it's telling us, on average, how fast did people walk in each of these different conditions. However, there's no measure of spread. It doesn't really tell us anything about the sample size or the number of data points that we had. And it doesn't tell us about the correlation between the measures. Because if this was the same person at high and low, well, were the fast people here also the fast people here? You know, or, or sorry, I should say, were the did the people who found it effortful here also find it effortful here? Right? We, we don't have that information at the moment. So we could add you know, some, some things to this graph, like we could add a standard error bar or a standard deviation bar, um, but you know, that, that, you know, that doesn't really tell us everything that we might wanna see because that tells us about how the mean varies, but it doesn't really tell us about individual data points, right? We kinda of lose something here still. So if we wanna take it a step further, what if we just plot all the data? Okay, so in that case, I am just showing every single data point in each of these conditions. You do get a sense of how people performed here, right? And to paraphrase Carl Pearson, we've now put our data on the table, but we've also lost something. 
we're no longer showing a measure of central tendency, which is useful not only for the eye to kind of zero in on and say, aha, on average, this is how people were doing, but measures of central tendency are also critical to the statistics that we're going to calculate. Right? When we actually want to make an inference from the sample back to the population, we need to calculate what the mean was here. So it would be nice to show that in our figure. So we've gained a rich description, but we've lost some correspondence to the analysis that we're actually going to carry out. Okay, so what if we added a box plot overlaid on top of those data? So now I'm showing all the data and I'm showing something about the median, right? And these box plots also show the interquartile range around the median. Uh, so, so, you know, without getting into too much detail, if those terms are unfamiliar, I've added basically a measure of central tendency and a measure of spread while all the data points are visible. So I think this is actually a, a much improved plot, right, uh, in terms of the fact that we get to see all the data, we get to see kind of on average how people are doing in each condition, although technically in this case it's, it's where the, the median is in each condition. Um, but the one thing that could still be improved upon here is that this was a within subjects design. So we might like to know which data points belong to whom, right? And are the people who found the fast condition effortful also the people who found the low condition effortful, right? Or, or was there really no correlation in those things between conditions? So as kind of a final step, what we can do is actually draw dots between those data points, and then we can overlay the means for the two conditions. So this allows us to then see, ah, well, here's the person who found the high condition the most effortful, they actually found the low condition the least effortful. So their effort changed a lot over here, right? And we're showing all the data points so you get a sense of the spread, but we're also showing on average what the mean was in the high condition and what the mean was in the low condition as a function of whether it was the fast speed or the self-selected speed. So by connecting the dots, we can kind of provide that final piece of information about the correlation between conditions. And now we're being, we're very accurate and we're very efficient in terms of what we're conveying with this data visualization. We have measures of central tendency clearly visible. We have some information about the spread, which is clearly visible. Information about the sample size is there if someone actually wants to go and count all the dots. And people know something about the correlation between those data points because we're actually showing which data points belong to whom and connecting them with those lines. Right? So these are our principles of, of you know, shape, color, style, right? things that we might want to do in order to accurately display information. And again, as we go from sort of nominal data to interval ratio data, we have more options available to us in how we want to display that information. And as our experimental design changes, we have uh, a lot of differences in terms of what is critical to display. So those are all contextual decisions, right? But for across any data visualization you're gonna to wanna to make, it needs to be an accurate summary of the information and it needs to be efficient, right? People should be able to look at it and understand what they're supposed to take away from that data visualization. And if it's too complex for them to understand, you probably need to go back to the drawing board and improve your data visualization.